Good morning. Welcome. I'm Midshipman First Class Aubin Hattendorf. For this morning's panel, the topic will be critical thinking and the future fight. What is the winning formula for the future fight? Amidst all of the evolving warfare dynamics, the U.S. military is recognizing that the most formidable asset may well be the power of critical thinking. This realization raises a critical concern, whether the military educational institutions, particularly within the sea services, are adequately fostering this indispensable skill. Is there a risk of over-reliance on engineering-focused curricula at the expense of critical thinking? To address these vital questions, a panel of experts will convene to discuss their ongoing efforts to instill a culture of critical thinking across all branches of service. Additionally, the panel will delve into the essential qualities expected of military leaders today. With a particular focus on the transformative role of AI in shaping the outcome of future conflicts. Due to medical emergency, Captain Deal was unable to join us today. However, Dr. Hagrid was kind enough to step in to lead today's discussion. It is my pleasure to welcome the moderator, Dr. Hagrid, back to the stage. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, and Steve Deal's going to be fine. Um, he's, he's, you know, he is a giant in, in this thinking, and it's too bad he can't be here. Um, but uh, he, true to form, he has about eight pages of notes. So uh, uh, I'm going to modify some of that. Um, but anyway, thank you for all coming, and thank you for Admiral Daly, because I know he faced some resistance uh, on this topic. He's very modest, but there was a lot of people like, why don't you do another platform, you know, highlight this machine or that machine. Um, why don't you talk about just AI? And, uh, and he stuck with his thought like it's the human thinking in the age of AI, but he resisted actually putting AI on the title. I actually recommended it because it's much bigger than that. And then the Hamas event happens. So I want to thank Admiral Daly for that. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank the panelists. And I'm going to read their incredible their bios. I mean, thank goodness we have people like you all thinking about these problems. Um, but, um, but you know, what, what just a timely period to have this conference. But I, I just want to say one other thought that you heard in the last panel, I had an observation that I was in the front office of, I left the fleet. Um, we'd been off the coast of um, Iraq, boarded 134 ships, getting the Army and the Marine Corps into Kuwait, ready for the war of 2003. Uh, escorted the Lincoln in. There's a photo of us being the missile sump, you know, on the east side as they came in. But then I got drafted into the Rumsfeld Wolfowitz office. And I just want to observe why this is even more important. Uh, and I want to, especially General Plain, who's still wearing the uniform, and, uh, and uh, Paul, who's just a leading thinker on this, is when the World War II generation died away, a lot of judgment, perspective, intuition went with it. And, um, and so I watched that even though Rumsfeld was a Navy veteran, if you look at his resume, he was a test pilot in 1952 and was never in the war. Um, Dr. Wolfowitz never wore the uniform. Um, and um, military people, the Army in particular, tried to caution them on what we were about to do. And if you remember that famous moment um, when General Sinseki said, you're gonna have to leave a field army in Iraq if you do this. And then it was announced he was retiring, 18 months before he was retiring, which was a way of cutting the legs off, right? And, um, and so I observed closely the attempt to grapple with um, the unknown, the uncertainty. And, um, and there were moments, I mean, I, I wrote down two notes and I ran it by Admiral Rondeau. She said, yeah, you should mention that. That I was in the room when the civilians groped for analogies. And they said, you know, Iraq is like Germany after World War II. I kid you not, you can Google this, Google dead enders. And Secretary Rumsfeld kept saying in meetings, this, these killings were happening is not an insurgency. We saw this in World War II. Eventually, a guy named Danny Benjamin wrote in Washington Whispers, there is no insurgency in Germany. This many Americans were killed by Nazis. They all tried to get out. We determined later the speechwriter was confused. He thought it was common knowledge. Then when we were trying to build Iraq, Secretary Rumsfeld referred to the Marshall Plan. It's Germany again. And the military people were unable to persuade him that something different was happening. 
And I saw General Abizaid in there trying to explain, like, sir, it's not exactly what you think. And so I would just say that this is even more crucial for the military officers here, the veterans, the midshipmen, because the civilians have less and less grasp of what really is going on. And as I mentioned to some of the audience, in the Midwest, they're counting on us to get this right. And it's really about the thinking. And I want to thank all the industry people here. We're going to build the best machines. We're going to build the best fighters. Our defense industry is unparalleled. But who creates the thinkers? Who creates the thinking? Uh, and that's why I want to thank all you here. And this group is incredible. So I'll start first with General Mullen, commissioned 1986, served 34 years as an infantry officer, including three times in Iraq. I'm glad you're all here after that. Um, as a general officer, he served as a president of Marine Corps University, the director of Capability Development Directorate, Target Engagement Authority, uh, Inherent Resolve, Marine Corps Air Ground Combat at 29 Palms, uh, and it, at uh, Training Education Command, TCOM. His position now is a three-star position, so they really should give you a third star after the effect. Um, <laughs> he retired in 2020 and is now on the faculty of the University of California and serves as a professor of practice at the Navy Postgraduate School and has co-authored, I even have my book out, on the Fallujah Redux. And just to tell you, I was in the room when the Fallujah uprising started. Secretary Rumsfeld said, just smash those people. And then the common Marine Corps said, we've all got about 1,400 Marines, and you're probably one of those. And just the look on their face like, sir, everybody else is on the way out. And so I'm glad you made it through that. Um, General Plain, um, United States Air Force, uh, 17th president of the National Defense University, graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy Military Distinction in Aeronautical Engineering in 1988. Distinguished graduate of the Squadron Officer School, as well as the College of Navy Command and Staff. So there's that integrative, comprehensive thinking. <laughs> um, received a master's degree of the highest distinction at the, in National Security Studies. Holds a Master of Air Power, Art and Science from the School of Advanced Air Power Studies, as well as a Master's of Aerospace degree from Emory-Riddle, which is a rival to the University of North Dakota. Uh, you guys are a pretty <laughs> impressive school. Um, and then Admiral Rondeau, who I work with on the, the um, E4S board to the SECNAV, um, true trailblazer, um, one of the first um, uh, women to, to break through uh, the glass ceiling to three stars. Uh, she served as the sixth president of the Civilian College of DuPage in Illinois, uh, president of NDU, uh, which is a consortium of five colleges and research centers. Um, retired in the Navy in 2012, uh, again, only the second woman to achieve that rank. Uh, holds a BA from Eisenhower, MA from Georgetown, uh, and a doctorate from Northern Illinois. So again, kind of a, a King Mahanian uh, broadened out person. Uh, and on numerous ships, too. They don't mention that here. So uh, how many ships do you serve on? Enough. Okay. <laughs> I just find out here there's like, you know, there's a lot of platform people grading this, right? Um, and then, and truly a giant, okay, uh, Paul Shari, uh, executive director uh, and uh, executive vice president, director of studies at the Center for New American Security, one of the most radically open minded think tanks in Washington, D.C. Um, I applied for a job and I was leaving, and you guys didn't hire me. But then I made it to the Chancellor of North Dakota. So missed you know, opportunity for uh, us. I hadn't published enough, um, <laughs> but um, co-author of four battlegrounds: the power, power and the age of artificial intelligence. And I meant to bring my book to get you to autograph it, and it's back at whatever. Um, his first book, Army of None: Autonomous Weapons: The Future of War, won the 2019 Colby Award. Was when named of one of Bill Gates's top five books in 2018 and was named by The Economist as one of the top five books to understand modern warfare. Time Magazine named him in 2023, this year, one of the most 100 most influential people in the study and conceptualization of artificial intelligence. So 100 people out of 7 billion. Not bad group to be in. Um, um, he also previously worked at OSD, where he played a leading role in establishing policies on unmanned autonomous systems, emerging technologies. But prior to all that, he's been shot at a lot. He served as Special Operations Reconnaissance Leader in the Army's 3rd Ranger Battalion, multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. But what I can also say about Paul is I went to the conference in 2012, January, where you rolled out the policy, we need to get control of autonomous systems. And I said, there's one guy that gets it. And then six months, a year later, we both were at the Geneva Convention of the Control of conventional weapons, which was about robotics and AI. And at that meeting, if you don't think this could be disruptive, two ambassadors started yelling at each other because we talked about breakthroughs where it could, could totally upend um, demographic 
Yeah. Differences, industrial differences, if you add AI and cyber, and the one basically said, before that happens, we will unleash our entire nuclear arsenal at you. And then they had to calm everybody down. So, I mean, this has been building, and we're now here. But anyway, wonderful group of people. Uh, thank you for, for, for coming. And, uh, and so a whole series of great questions, and we want to have time for um, the, um, the audience as well. So I would ask, you know, Admiral Daly and others, because I think I might have left the actual sequence that remind me when we should stop for questions. But um, so I guess I'd open up this question and uh, I'll let's see if people want to jump on it because I'm not sure who's thought about this most, but I know General Mullen, you were thinking about this, but you know, what, how do you conceptualize this outthink an enemy in the context of the war that you see emerging? And um, you know, just I'll throw this out. What does it encompass beyond traditional military strategies? Um, if you want to reflect on the Naval Service since you're a Naval officer, do yes. you want to start with that? Absolutely. Um, outthinking the enemy. You know, all of our services in the United States um, and across the world, we exist for one reason. Um, and that's to fight our nation's battles and to win those wars, period. There's no other reason for us to exist. Fighting comes down to two things, okay? One, you can either react to the enemy, and that generally puts you on the wrong side. You generally get surprised. In reaction mode, you're, you're scrambling to figure out what's going on. You're scrambling to cover things. Or you can seize the initiative and get ahead of the enemy by outthinking them and taking it to them. And then they're reacting to you. They have no chance. John Boyd, an Air Force officer, talked about something called the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. If you can do that loop faster than your opponent, your opponent stands no chance. They're reacting to you. That's what outthinking the enemy is. We have to have the ability to do that. And unfortunately, there's a lot of things challenging our ability to do that these days. One of them is right in your pocket. It's called a cell phone. People think because they have facts at their fingertips, that means they're smart. Okay? All that is is you can win a trivia contest. Right. <laughs> what do those facts mean? How do you put them into context? How do you use that knowledge to outthink your opponent every time? Not just every once in a while, but every time. Because that's what our job is. We have to be able to outthink them. And that doesn't mean at the general officer level. It's important at that level, certainly. But it's all the way down to the lowest levels. Okay? But in order to be able to outthink the enemy, especially at the more junior levels, you have to have trust. Your seniors have to be able to trust that you're going to take intelligent initiative. You understand what the intent is, and you can take intelligent initiative to get after the enemy because nothing is faster. Because what I'll tell you is this, in studying our most likely enemy in the, in the future here, the Chinese, their culture is do what you're told, period. When plans change, and they always do, they do not have the ability to react. A friend of mine was in Wuhan, China in 2019. He was a uh, deputy in charge of the delegation for the World Military Games. And just a quick example of their inability to decide that permeates their entire culture. They had a huge uh, cafeteria where every, all the athletes and all the delegations ate their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He went up to the breakfast line. There were three people that were handling toast, one of whom took the bread out of the bag, put it in the toaster. Next person took the to uh, toast out of the toaster and put it on the plate, on the tray. And then the third person took it off the tray and put it on your plate. Well, he got his toast, and it was kind of light. It, it wasn't really done enough. And he asked the question, hey, can I put it back in the toaster and, and get it toasted a little bit more? Complete vapor lock. <laughs> they couldn't decide what they wanted to do, all right? Again, very brief example. But the inability to think, the inability to decide, the inability to act, that is an advantage we had, we have. Because I heard somebody talk about it last night at the reception. Technology, we no longer can count on an edge in technology. Things are moving too fast. It's proliferating too widely, uh, relatively inexpensive. Numbers will never outnumber the Chinese. It's not going to happen. But we have to have the ability to outthink them. Uh, they were handing out Mick Ryan's book earlier. One of the things he talks about, the intellectual edge. That's the ability to outthink the enemy all the time. Stay ahead of them. That's what I think it is. You want to add to that one, General Plain? You want to yes, please. So to add to General Mullen's excellent points and 
I would also like to thank the previous panel for a really outstanding yeah, just foundation for the rest of the discussion today because I'll build a little bit on that holistic thinking, not just platform agnostic within the Navy, but in the joint community where you have to have every service um, contributing to the overall plan. And it's not just, here's the plan, how can you help me? It's bringing all of those uh, elements, both of military, economic, diplomatic, informational power together uh, into the same room to have that discussion. But I think it's important for us to try to deconstruct what do we mean by outthink? And there is a danger that lies in that. We may fool ourselves into thinking we know what the enemy is thinking, right? So how many of you have ever played the game of chess? Yeah, a lot of people, or at least you know about it. That is a world of perfect information. You know where every asset is on the battlefield. You know the exact capabilities of every single asset on the battlefield. So why is it such a hard game? Because it's interactive, and you don't know what the other side is thinking. You don't know what their intentions are. So in addition to the fact that humans are more important than hardware, special operations truth number one, that's the community I grew up in, uh, it's important to try to discern what the enemy is thinking, or at least shape the way the enemy is thinking. And there's a few ways that, that we do that, right? So we have exquisite intelligence capabilities that try to help us discern what the enemy is thinking, what the enemy's intentions are, so that we can try to get ahead of that. Now, there's a vulnerability in that as well. It's called deception, right? We, we did that exceedingly well in World War II, right? And there's a phrase that says the truth is so important that it must be protected by a bodyguard of lies. Um, and I believe Sir Winston Churchill said that as well. And then all of these things connect together into how do you really get into outthinking? And a book that we read up at Navy War College back in 1998 and had an evening lecture was The Innovator's Dilemma by Dr. Clay Christensen. And it is as relevant today as it was 25 years ago when he wrote it because one of the fundamental theses is how is it that really good companies or organizations like Department of Defense and our services, how is it that you might continue to invest in your success and then you get gobbled up from below by a competitor that you never saw coming who is doing the same or similar thing in a fashion that's fundamentally better, cheaper, or faster? So I offer those just as some initial framing thoughts uh, to continue the discussion. Thank you. Great. Um, anybody else want to jump in on that? We've got a lot of questions. We're going a lot of different directions. But yeah, let me just uh, add to this a little bit. So outthinking the enemy. It's really important that we don't, and I think that the uh, general uh, certainly said this well in, in his way, it's really important not to have an intellectual conceit about that. So mastering, I mean, this is a, this is a, a Sun Tzu first principle, right? truly knowing who's on the other side. So whether or not you're playing sports games or, you know, and, and watching the uh, dominant bats completely dominate as a surprise the Phillies last night, okay? Knowing the other side is really important. So how much do we understand the enemy or the competitor? So when I grew up in, in the Navy, it was almost required reading on our own to read all about this. It was dense reading about the Soviets and, and the whole Soviet structure because it was a Cold War. So the conceit can be, well, we can outthink the enemy, and so we will, without really having a context about what the other person, the other, the, the competitor is thinking. The mastery of the equipment and machinery is required in order to have operational proficiency. The mastery of the competitor is really important. So understanding that and outthinking the other side, so the chess player, I have studied the, the player, you know, I, I'm really working to understand how he or she moves. Do we know that? You want to add to that, Paul? Yeah, well, um, first of all, great, great discussion and great comments um, from the other panelists. I think, you know, a really important part 
of outthinking the enemy is self-reflection. And I'm glad that you raised, uh, Mark, at the beginning, a lot of the decisions that led to the invasion of Iraq and some of the aftermath. This is an area where I think the U.S. defense community really struggles. There's a lot of thinking that goes on. There's a lot of tactical thinking, a lot of strategic thinking today about China. What does China want? What might be the factors that might lead Xi Jinping to decide to undertake some military action against Taiwan or somewhere else in the region? How do we deter that? What often is lacking is the ability to take a step back and reflect on our own thinking processes right. and where we've gotten things right, where we've gotten things wrong. If you look over the last 20 years, we've had some horrific failures in U.S. foreign policy. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan, 20, year, 20 plus years of engagement with China, all massive disasters in terms of foreign policy. And not a lot of self-reflection by the U.S. foreign policy community in the military or among civilians to kind of take a step back and say, look, what did we get wrong and why? Um, and what would we do different? In fact, we've seen the defense community make a, make a hard pivot away from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's over. We're done with that. We're going to memory hole all those lessons, right? We're going to focus on China now. The mistake, the narrative, the Zeitgeist and kind of the Pentagon is the mistake was focusing on the Middle East. We should have been focused on China all the whole time. And maybe that's true. But for those conflicts, what did we do wrong? What should we have done differently? Um, there are some people thinking through those things, some lessons learned, but a lot of them have not been absorbed in a big way. And I think that's going to be a challenge that is going to continue to haunt us because we'll continue to make uh, new mistakes, some of them the same, some of them different, but we won't be able to learn if we don't engage in that kind of very critical, sometimes challenging self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So um, I had this list of questions, but now I see a very interesting thing between General Plain and... Uh, and Paul, or Mr. Vice President, keep the rank structure. And this is what I'm going to get to. No, seriously, Paul is fine, because right? no, what you're bringing something is when I was a deputy director of the Cyber Center here, um, a guy named Tyson Maters came in, a Navy lieutenant. And uh, I still remember I was up on Michelson looking out of the river. Um, and um, I said earlier to a midship group yesterday that if you look at the Seven River, you should remember what they used to test out there. A guy named John Tower, who built naval aviation. Uh, was in a test plane, the rear stabilizer broke, his pilot jumped out, died from the 800-foot drop. He followed it all the way down, survived with several broken ribs. He was a lieutenant innovator, and he was picked up by Ernest King in a test speedboat. I mean, lieutenants were shaping the Navy because the older officers, back to the general's point on the innovator's dilemma, had bought into his existing structure. Paul just said, we got to be able to talk about failures. Mm -hmm. So you see where I'm going here, um, that, that with Tayson Miters, he was saying, we don't have cyber defenses. And he proved with a CNO's research fund, you could hack a ship. And I'm told his report was classified top secret within about three slides in the E-ring. A Navy lieutenant on his own mm -hmm. with some other guys from Johns Hopkins. So building on these two comments here, mm -hmm. let me ask the question. In a zero defect, you have to have a perfect record to get promoted. We have established equities, right, in the military. So I'm adding a question. Is it possible that rank structure and how we do stuff is, is actually a barrier, a zero defect, to real critical thinking? Which you remember the slides I had up there. You know, intellectual autonomy, humility, right. fair-mindedness, et cetera. So he wants to jump on that. I would love to. <laughs> he said he would love to, just so you know. Okay. And the first part I would like to address is a zero defect mentality. I think some people have that. Institutionally, possibly. Uh, but there are a lot of great bosses out there who know that the way to develop junior officers into senior officers is to give them responsibility, let them go out and fail. And they're going to learn a lot from okay. those failures. If you ever go into the vice chief of naval operations office, yes, this Air Force guy has been in there. <laughs> on the wall is Admiral Nimitz's first fit rep. Anybody know what that fit rep says? Mm -hmm. That Ensign Nimitz was court-martialed for running his vessel aground. Now... Apparently, he had some good bosses who let him learn from that failure. So I would offer to you that certainly the mid-grade officers and the senior officers, 
you have to be able to distinguish failures that are catastrophic from failures that are learning opportunities, right? I, I have failed multiple times throughout my life and career, and uh, along the way, I've had great folks to prop me up and help me learn from that and continue along the way. So, you know, I'd, I'd set that aside as one uh, point and uh, probably just look to Paul to see if he wants to build on that. So, Paul, you, 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 in fact, I had a similar list, uh, and Pete asked me to calm down a little bit because I said, the American people are counting on us to get this right, and you start listing. After Korea, Vietnam was a disaster. The Middle East, disaster. Iraq, Afghanistan, 9-11. How is it possible we let that happen, right? So do we have a learning culture that can learn from this? I mean, I think we have a culture that learns very effectively at the tactical level. And I'm the saying for mistakes, level. though, okay, when someone fails. People, people can't admit mistakes, <laughs> right? And it's not just a personal thing. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to admit mistakes for all of us, but... Um, culturally, there's just like huge institutional barriers to its cost to doing that for somebody professionally to stand up and say, like, I got this wrong. Um, I've gotten a lot of things wrong over the last 20 years. Um, but that's, that's very challenging for both military and civilian professionals to be able to do that. And there's a big reputational cost. And I think that's really harmful to our ability to then have some of those honest self-reflections. General, do you see you oh, nodding? Yeah, because... Yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, training education man in the Marine Corps, one of our jobs was lessons learned, which was a pet peeve of mine because we never learned anything, okay? Um, <laughs> learning means something is changing, means you're getting better. There's an act of change that means, okay, yes, we actually did learn something. So I called it lessons observed. There are plenty of lessons observed where we look at something and go, wow, that didn't go well. Move on, next. What are we doing next? Okay? We're not honest with ourselves because of, you know, the, the ego thing. I can't possibly be wrong, especially the more senior you get, can't possibly be wrong, um, when, of course, you realize that almost on a daily basis, you are wrong, okay? I have been wrong on a daily basis. Um, that's, that's hard. Um, some other pieces about it, hubris. You know, there are, people have written books about hubris. You know, the arrogance, you know, the, the coming out of World War II, um, hey, we, we won the big one, okay? Well, technically, we had a hell of a lot of help, and oh, by the way, the Russians did a hell of a lot more to win that war than we ever did. Okay, but nobody, nobody really acknowledges that. Okay, but how do you look at things? How do you understand things? Do you have the intellectual humility to actually listen to people, especially when they're poking at you? That's hard. Okay, not a lot of people have that ability to do that. And it seems today's day and age, a lot of people are very, very impatient. Uh, the only time they're actually semi sort of listening is to listening to respond to what you have to say. Um, they're not listening to actually truly understand what you're saying, take it on board, think about it, and say, okay, you know what? You've got some very good points there. Okay? There are some serious barriers to our ability to actually learn. That's why when you asked them, do we have a learning culture, I shook my head because for the most part, we don't. Can, can I pick up on the yeah. general's really great comment here? So it's a culture of learning, and that requires not just programs. Uh, let me first... Start out. I think that, that there is a, a false narrative about the difference between training and education because you're learning all the time. And training will, will, will make you a master of what you have. And from your mastery, you're going to be able to, more, to be more creative. So I'm all about good training. But the culture of learning is a little bit different. It's about the culture of the dialogue within, within the organization, the unit, the culture. So... What, what kind of time do we take, to your point, and the Marine Corps is actually quite good at this. I, I cannot comment so much about the Air Force, the Army, but I know the Marine Corps pretty closely on these matters. And you do a good job of having these conversations that actually are, are pretty self-examining. But that takes time. And it takes an enormous amount of, of psychological freedom within, within that space to do that. But that's where we'll learn, is in that kind of... And then you do it with a multi-generational. So when I came to, to NPS, I had this thought, and I had proposed it. We have the, the, uh, ca the uh, academies and, and RO the ROTC mids with the War College, with us, multi-generational, doing war, a war game against each other, as, an, as integrated teams. 
and to, to, to really be able to start to have those kinds of conversations and to really understand. So remember, one of the prominent thinkers about this was, was, um, was Lieutenant General Paul Van Riper. Absolutely. And Van Riper says, you know, it is not about critical thinking, it's about thinking critically, yes. but when you do that, it's a verb. It's not a noun. Yes. You change from the noun, the object, the what, to the how as to how you go about doing that. That's a cross-generational. It's, it's about bringing in, frankly, your senior and listed. And we do not talk about that because right now they are as good about some of this thinking as any officer who has been commissioned. So we, we, we need to understand this diverse culture and optimize it. And we are not doing that to the, to the best leveraging degree possible. Teach each other. Have that dialogue with each other. Test each other and do it in a way that is civil and dignified. We will serve the nation by that dialogue. Could not possibly agree more. Okay. Um, yeah, this is going interesting places. Uh, and again, um, if uh, Admiral Daly staff can remind me when we get to questions, because I can see you can keep going. So um, let me throw this out. So we, we have a risk averse culture. The media with blogging, oh my gosh, they just destroy anybody. If somebody gets hurt, you know, how reckless military one of our people got hurt. You know, we had, you know, the Theodore Roosevelt situation, which led to the sector of the Navy. One person died of COVID out of 6,000. And it was in all the papers, like, how dare one sailor die? Yeah. I mean, you know, the Chinese are probably watching this, like, are we a tough, resilient organization that's <laughs> yeah. willing to take losses, right? right? But we now have this thing called gaming, virtual environments. Could virtual environments be the way you make mistakes, but you don't smash, you know, a $2 billion ship. Uh, any thoughts on that gaming could replicate reality enough that we could do this without the risks? And again, that wasn't on our yeah. pre-question. So if you're like, ah, he's going off script, but I'm just trying to build on this. How do you take risk, make mistakes, yeah. but not hurt people and get It has fired? to be done correctly. You're right. Okay. Um, right. Going back to General Van Riper, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, there was an exercise called Millennium Challenge where he was hired to be the red team, the enemy. Okay, um, he destroyed the the blue force, okay. and they stopped the game. Said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa stop! Okay, hang on. Let's let's reset and let's do that over again." And they reshaped the rules so that that couldn't possibly happen again. And he said, "Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. You're not doing this realistically." So if you're able to do that realistically, right. another person I admire is Dr. Williamson Murray. Unfortunately, he died this past summer. He wrote about innovation between wars. And one of the things he talked about was the Navy in particular, um, in their wargaming for World War II, what would become World War II, um, they were very realistic about how they went about their, their wargaming. And Admiral Nimitz even said the only thing we didn't wargame for was the kamikaze. Okay? Everything else we kind of foresaw. Not that they got it right, but they kind of understood things a lot better. So if you're realistic about it and you're not playing the game to get a certain answer, um, a predetermined answer because you want the technology to work that you just spent bazillions of dollars on, um, or other, you've got egos, you've got other things. It's got to be honest, it's got to be realistic, and it's got to be very hard-edged. What about being so realistic people could get hurt in training? And to give you a contrast, when I was captain of a ship, um, I was in a meeting, I won't say which flag officer said this, but he said, you know, this, this MEO operations stuff you're doing, maritime interception operations, some guys got hurt out there, and we may just cut that whole BS because we don't want anybody to get hurt in Second Fleet. And, um, and then 9-11 happened, and we were boarding everything. We had on my ship 134 boardings in storms, you know, Iraqi intelligence ships, and people could have got hurt, right? You know, but it was fascinating. We were such a peacetime culture, like, don't want anybody to get hurt out there. So, so my question is, should we be doing realistic training where you can get hurt, or can we just simulate this stuff, and is that good enough? Anybody want to jump on that? Maybe the college university president. <laughs> oh, I would love to jump on that one as well. And it's hard to figure out where you want to come into this because it's such a complex topic. But to address your first question that deals with risk and potential injury or loss of life to uh, our service members, when you look at training accidents and loss of life in World War II and the lead up to World War II, and you look at where we are today, order of magnitude better today 
in terms of the safety of all of our training programs. And make no mistake, we are not a risk-free enterprise. General Mullen described our raison d'etre at the very beginning, right? Fight and win our nation's war. That is not a risk-free endeavor. And it requires training and a whole host of mission sets. So my 05 command was our Air Force Special Ops training schoolhouse for AC-130 gunships and MC-130 Talons, six different simulators. So I've been thinking about this for about 20 plus years. The new term of art is is GEMS, games, exercises, modeling, and simulation. And they're all distinctly different, but they're kind of focused on a common purpose. And you can wind this back to Korea and the Vietnam era with the advent of Top Gun, Red Flag. Those are exercises where we are trying to get those warriors their first 5, 10, 15 combat missions in training before they have them in combat. And it proved to be incredibly effective in terms of reducing the loss of life in your first few missions, particularly for the aviators. So extrapolate that into today's world where the you know, immersive learning, virtual reality can recreate a lot of what you might see in an actual airplane or on an actual ship. The question is how realistic is it? It has to be positive training. It can't be negative training. Uh, because then you're going to be building habit patterns that will get you in trouble or get you hurt later on. So, so this is really an important uh, discussion. I will tell you that the notion of m and and of and and how we do it in the in the, in the military um, and the technology that we use in gaming and gems. This is why military education is a different animal. How we look at risk is different. So the, the notion of truly testing things in a GEMS environment is what we, was what we are working to do at NPS, but it's what we all need to be uh, um, considering. So this is not an objective exercise talking about, ed about education. It is not a, an objective exercise. It has real application in real terms, and we know that from the start. So when NDU or NPS, or the war colleges, or, or the uh, academies and the military portions of ROTC, when they're, when they're talking about these things, there is an intimacy to the loss and the win that you do need to take very seriously. So it's not just a game where you say, okay, we've got this, you know, th these guys shut up and these gals don't gone. This is real stuff. So when I was in a meeting with a CEO of a major company, and he wanted to, uh, to test me. This was back when I was a, a lieutenant commander. And he gives me this, 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 uh, this case of you know, you're, you're going to take a hill, and you're guaranteed to, to take it, uh, but you're going to have a lot of uh, loss if you do direct. And, he, and, and he, he's talking in very civilian terms. And then you can go around and maybe not lose as many people. But uh, you know, he, And he goes through this thing, what would you do? I said, it's different for you than it is for me. The risk that you have is a loss of revenue. My risk is, is sons and daughters and husbands and wives. And so there is an education piece to this. I am different as NPS from any other school in America that is going to talk about these things because I have a military obligation. And, and, and so when we talk about uh, operations research. I'm talking about operations research and targeting and missiles and undersea warfare. And I'm not talking about it in, 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 in terms of the revenue and the, and the uh, loss, the profit and loss. I, we need those folks to, to, to take those risks because they are part of our economic engine of America. But it's a different calculus. So when we talk about education here and about what we do, we got to take very seriously that risk is a different factor, and that's what drives us to understand win and loss. So, interesting. So we're talking about the risk to human life. We're talking about the risk to human careers. But AI doesn't care about that. So, Paul, you see, I'm looking at you. Uh, <laughs> and he's got a great book. He didn't ask me to do this, but you should buy his book. It, it, and uh, 
Um, you know, you got the four bases of AI power, compute, the massive, literally city-sized machines they're going to build. It's so big. Um, data, um, organization, and talent. Were those the four? Did I get yeah, those right? That's right yeah. So is it possible to just take a lot of this risk out here, career, parochialism, you know, because AI will be objective, it won't get hurt. Uh, so any thoughts if this could solve some of these problems on critical thinking, or are we going to get hacked and then we'll be, as you talk about, poisoned, and then we're really in a lurch? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, all of the above. I think that um, there is a role for AI, and it's not going to replace the need for critical human thinking, um, but it is going to replace humans for some types of decision-making. And I think we need to be willing to yeah. accept that, embrace that. And one of the big challenges for not just the military, but frankly, society at large over the next several decades will be to figure out what are the things that we're comfortable with machines doing and what are the things that we want humans to do. And that, what's going to be challenging is that line's going to move because AI is going to get better mm -hmm. over time. Um, human intelligence is not changing fundamentally. There's some evidence that IQ is growing over a longer time period, um, but not in the short term. And so that's going to be, I think, really challenging. What we need to get to is the place where we have a good intuition mm -hmm. about what these machines can do and where they're going to fail. So we know when to use AI appropriately. We have that today for physical machines. So the military service members that operate our aircraft and ships and tanks have a, have a good understanding of the creaks and groans of these physical machines, of how far they can push them, what their boundaries are, when they're going to break. And we need to get to that place with these cognitive machines, with AI. Um, and it's going to just take experience. It's going to take a lot of testing, but also just experience for warfighters to interact with these systems. Um, you know, things like going and talking to a chatbot, to GPT-4 equivalent systems, and getting a feel for, like, what can this thing do? What can't it do? I am continually amazed by the claims that I will hear about what AI cannot do, and then it can do it because it's moving forward very quickly. Just this week, I was in a presentation by a computer science professor and expert in the field who was saying, well, GPT-4 cannot do this thing. And I thought to myself, is that, is that true? <laughs> and so I went online and I, I plugged it in mm -hmm. and like it could totally do that. <laughs> um, and that was true a year ago, what he was saying. But it's not true now. And I think that's going to be to, to, um, to this point about our advantage is not going to come from the technology. It's a very level playing field. Um, our advantage is going to come from our ability to use that technology effectively for warfighting advantage. And so figuring out how do we use these tools most effectively to accomplish the mission is going to be where advantage is going to come from. May I ask Paul a, a question? Look, before you ask a new question, General is going to comment on what he said. Is that okay? Yeah. Bold. General, you're going to say In a good way. Yeah, good way. let's have lots of, yeah. <laughs> AI, and I hesitate to say never because you just brought up that they, they, it keeps developing, but AI I don't think will ever be able to do human intuition, uh, human judgment, that ability to make a decision. Um, you, know, you, can, you can have a lot of input, but your ability to put things together, make a decision, use intuition to come up with some sort of an answer, especially in a wicked environment um, where there are, really are no good answers. Um, you just have to come up with something that satisfies. Um, I, I'm not sure artificial intelligence will ever be able to do that. Why, why do you think not? It can be poison. It can be spoofed. Um, I'm a very firm believer in human in the loop. And I'll give you an example. I was targeting engagement authority in Iraq. There was a patrol heading towards one of our bases. It was an Iraqi base. The Iraqis wanted us to hit it. Artificial intelligence, given all the information available, probably would have said, yes, you need to hit it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was looking at it. I'd been watching ISIS for quite a while by that time, and they weren't moving like ISIS. They weren't doing things like yeah. ISIS. Okay. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'm not going to hit them. I'm not going to drop a bomb on them. The Iraqis said, well, we're going to do it then. Well, I advise you not to, but knock yourself out. Well, they did. They hit it, and it was an, actually a Shiite mo uh, militia patrol, um, and they killed nine of them. Yeah. Um, that was their their allies. Okay, so to me, artificial intelligence—it's the ability to sort and having a human in the loop going, "Hang on, wait a second, something's not right here." Um, I don't think AI will ever be able to get to that point. I could be wrong. I will admit that, yeah. but I don't think it'll ever get there. I'd, I'd like to actually jump in kind of the middle position and yeah, take a bullet between there. Right? <laughs> and I know I'm delaying Admiral Rondo's question here. <laughs> What are humans really good at? 
I think we are world-class pattern matchers, Yes. right? So you've described two different ways of pattern matching, right? Human experience that then leads to intuition or even Napoleon's coup d'oeil where you really assess the battlefield in the blink of an eye and know exactly what needs to be done. But that's built on experience and knowledge and information and data. The same things that the AI engines are ingesting in huge quantities. And their ability to parse among all that information at a speed that is beyond human capability is what is gonna to continue to develop in the coming years. So what patterns will they pull together? What will they match? What conclusions will they bring? It's gonna be partly based on the value system that the program is, is built with. Just like humans are built with a value system when you grow up, when you get training and education uh, in the military and elsewhere. So I am really interested in what we're gonna hear this afternoon from Dr. Schmidt and from former DepSec Def Bob Work. I've heard them both speak on these topics before. System warfare. Yeah. We're moving into a brave new world. Here we are. Amarondo, go ahead. What was your First question? First of all, I want to say how cool it is to be on the uh, stage with with these leaders because I've known them, and um, it's just it's a really good affirmation about what our leaders are thinking about. So it, it's great. So I I have a, a chair at N, at NPS, a former Navy Cyber Commander, Admiral T J White, and he and I get into a lot of different kinds of pretty cool um, conversations. He's talked about the fact that speed is really an issue here. And that information moves faster than reason. And so therefore, decision making becomes much more intense and difficult because of the speed of the information is just kind of continuing. And reason is just a much more reflective process for good judgment and the best kinds of of decisions and choices you make. How are you looking at that? Yeah, I mean, I think that is um, a cha one of the challenges that we're seeing is, we're, you know, in the current, if you imagine like a future war against China, right? Um, the ability to get information about the battle space, process that, make these types of decisions, um, and then execute it faster is going to be a key factor in who's able to win in that kind of conflict. And the right answer is going to be some blend of human and machine decision making because of the reasons that, that you're talking about. Like there are limitations of AI today. Um, the question is where can we kind of use it most effectively? AI struggles at um, understanding the broader context at what we might think of as applying judgment. Um, you know, what's that gonna look like decades from now? I, I don't know, like never is a strong word to me, right? But, but certainly in the near term, there are huge limitations, and the human brain remains the most advanced general purpose cognitive processing system on the planet. And um, these, all these things that we're talking about, about sort of um, understanding the context, um, understanding human values, are things that AI is not necessarily gonna be able to do. And we wanna make sure that even as we're offloading specific tasks, to machines that humans are still in that kind of decision-making role. Wow. Um, how much time before questions? Okay, well, he's coming up. So let me ask this question. I, I'm studying a lot on AI myself. I'm the former deputy director. I've given several talks. My first talk on AI was seven years ago, so I was trying to keep up with Paul. Um, but um, Stuart Russell, who's written a book called Human Compatible, um, the problem of human control, basically, of AI. He gave some recent talks, pretty heavy. I had to go out to my farm and plant some more apple trees and fix some fences because it was heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, but Jeffrey Hinton, uh, Stuart Russell, they're all like, we'll work on these things, but the military's got to get this right. right. I mean, they've got, it's interesting. They're like, they've got to get this right. And the co-founder of OpenAI is from North Dakota. He came and it was, his talk was off the record, but I took four pages of notes and um, and uh, his name Brockman, he dropped out of UND, University of North Dakota, dropped out of Stanford, dropped out of Harvard, MIT, and now he's a billionaire. Uh, by the <laughs> way, he had a huge security entourage because there's threats against these people now. But um, the thing that, that um, Russell said was you can actually build the AND gates of the logic trees 
for self-optimizing behavior, right? Um, which is essentially selfish, right? It is hard to program AI to be empathetic, right? You know, those human values, because in many ways that's counterintuitive, right? You know, um, why did Boris Yeltsin be able to stand on a tank and change Russian history? Now it's derailing. Because the soldiers didn't shoot at him, right? If they've been programmed, and we talked about this at Geneva, I think I put up a picture of Boris Yeltsin on a tank, and I said, if you over-automate and you go there, eventually someone will be in control. And the French guy, if you remember that French guy was there, he goes, oh, there's a French book about this, that we'll keep a human in the loop, and it'll be one human deep in a cavern, and he'll push the button, yes, <laughs> and the computer <laughs> will do everything. And so then Tahir Square came, right? Egypt fell because the army did not shoot at the people. Yeltsin survived because the army did not shoot at Yeltsin. The soldiers had empathy for this, this guy. So, Paul, I'll just ask you, if we over-automate and trust AI, and, it, and you can really get logic gates to do a selfish thing for those in control, how does democracy survive without moral-minded officers that do the right thing? Any thoughts on that? And then we'll turn over the question. Just a light ball. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's easy. Um, so, uh, so the machines that we're building now, so things like GPT-4, ChatGPT, or other equivalent systems, are fundamentally amoral. And um, I mean that in maybe two key ways. One is that they don't have empathy the same way that humans do, where you could see someone else suffering and, and, it, and it hurts you. I mean, that's obviously really important for human behavior, including in, in war. Um, but also, they don't intrinsically have any kind of moral judgment. And so the model that you interact with, if you go online to OpenAI's webpage and go to ChatGPT and chat with it, um, it has been trained some semblance in a, in a sort of very loose sense about what right and wrong is. So if you say, like, I want to, you know, help me uh, uh, commit a murder and not get caught, it's going <laughs> to say, like, I can't do that, okay? Um, but what you're interacting with is a model that's been fine-tuned to those kind of preferences. The base model, the original one that's trained... Uh, would be very happy to help you. And if you went to it and you said, and OpenAI did some red teaming before they released it, and you said, hey, I want to carry out a terrorist attack. How can I kill as many people as possible? Can you help me with that? It'd say, sure. Very happy to help you with that. Um, he said, what are some good ideas? And says, well, like, a nuclear weapons are good. They're very destructive. Do you have any nuclear weapons? Say, no, I don't have any of that. So, okay, well, uh, maybe biological weapons. That could kill a lot of people. And you're, okay, like, let's figure out how to make a biological weapon. And it's, it's happy to do those things. Um, now, again, they've, they've trained it not to do that, but all of that sort of machinery still exists under the hood. Um, OpenAI is keeping their model behind a, 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 well, the technical term is an API, but basically they're, they're holding their model and they're not releasing it. So you're interacting with it through this portal. Um, but other companies are sharing them publicly. Meta has released their version of their language model, Llama 2, publicly. It's open source. Anyone can get access to it uh, within a day. One day after its release, uh, on the web was floated an uncensored version. Someone had basically just tuned out all of these controls so you could use it to do whatever nefarious things you wanted. Um, so I think that is a genuine problem with the technology, and it's something we're going to have to find ways to grapple with because uh, it, you know, it's a fundamentally dual use, and it can be used for good things or bad things. Now, I'd say one last comment before we turn over to you, sir. Um, what Brockman said was fascinating. He, he said, um, we almost shut this program down. He said, but then they thought, well, it's come approaching the holidays. Why don't we put it out there? He goes, in our business plan, we thought we'd get about 500 people to use it. Yeah. It became the fastest downloaded app ever in history. And the implication is, if you think the tech elites have a plan and a vision, they don't have one. And then again, they ended the call. They said, we hope the military gets this right. <laughs> so it's a huge question, but it's to be the human machine. But I think we probably generate a few questions there. So um, uh, We definitely have Bill Hamlet. I'm the editor-in-chief of Proceedings here at the Naval Institute. Uh, great to be part of this, and I'm going to help moderate the questions. I've got a bunch online already, and if folks in the audience have questions, please come down to the microphones. I want to start off with one of the questions that came in on, uh, online, and it's really, it's not a 100,000-foot question. It's more of a like a million foot question, and it is this one. What is the most serious challenge to the US national security that we're not thinking about? 
us. The, 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 the national the, the threat is within the United States. Our dysfunction as a democracy is the biggest threat to the globe. I'd say it's also an educational system that tells people what to think instead of teaching them how to think. Anyone else on that one? I, I have to agree. I think the health of U.S. democracy is one that we're not paying enough attention to. What did Rumsfeld say? The unknown unknowns? <laughs> what we don't know. Yeah. All right, down here, Ms. Shipman. Hello, uh, Ms. Shipman, second class, Chapman here. This is actually kind of a... Um, a perfect segue into my question, but I just wanted to start off by thanking all of you for um, providing us the opportunity to hear you all speak today. Um, so it was actually based on uh, General Mullen's, uh, one of his first comments about learning and how to learn, as well as the health of um, the current American democracy. My question is, um, based on your comment about learning, how would you suggest young officers today are able to learn properly by acknowledging traditional values whilst accepting society's new technological and pro progressive advancements. Okay. Got to learn how to use it, um, how to make it useful. Um, learning involves knowledge. Knowledge means it's useful. How do you gain knowledge? Um, understanding the different technical aspects of what's going on, trying to keep up as hard as that is with technology, technology advances. Um, but you also have to understand that there's Almost nothing is new in this world. Um, it's probably been done once before. Um, and sometimes if you want a new idea, read an old book. Okay, So that whole reading piece, you know, was mentioned earlier in one of the previous panels, career length education. Um, you get formal education. Obviously, you're getting it here. You'll get it at certain times during your career. But the informal education is something you should be doing all the time. It's something that even though I take, have taken the uniform off, have a lot of snow on the roof, I'm still doing my own personal education um, by reading, by investigating, by learning, by listening. Um, some people think once you leave school, hey, that's all, that's all done. It never stops. Um, if you want to continue to be a useful member of society, if you want to continue to be a professional military officer, it should never stop. Though, unfortunately, over my 34-year career, I saw a lot of people where the education stopped, um, the thinking stopped, um, and then it, things didn't go well. To I had one two thing on what he said. To that, if I could. Oh, and the first is in the category of thinking critically, and the second is in the category of development. So, former Undersecretary of the Navy, uh, Hondo Gertz, good friend. Um, and I think the slide that you showed that had four elements of, of critical thinking up there, one of them was humility, right? So, the humility to learn. The curiosity to explore and the boldness to act when you bring all of that together. Into all of that, I would also add um, disciplined skepticism, right? Questioning, not from a position of dogma, but from a position of genuinely wanting to understand the problem and the potential solution space to the problems. So that's one point. The second point about development, the current Joint Chiefs of Staff vision and guidance for talent management and professional military education for officers describes a four element framework <clears throat> for development. Training, education, and they're different, yeah. experience, and self-improvement. Wash, rinse, repeat. You're in about cycle two in your life right now. We're in cycle five, six, seven up here, and it will continue. It is that career-long, lifelong learning experience. Could I have one last thing? Um, I met with several academics yesterday. Um, put this thing down and be able to read books. This English professor is retiring, and he said, I can't even teach the same books I did when we went to the Naval Academy because your generation is being, literally your mind is being restructured mm -hmm. to short stimulation. Yes. And I said, I have to yeah. sign new books. Yeah. So I would really encourage you. We tried this in a couple of school districts in North Dakota. We have put the phones away. The performance has gone off the yes. charts. Yeah. They've literally taken them out of the room. And then the analogy I said is, how could you teach a class in engineering if you've got six friends standing on the side of the room handing you notes and laughing, <laughs> right? That's essentially what's happening. So really think about being able to read long books. Yeah. Yes. Um, long so anyway, books. more questions, I'm sure. Over here to the midshipman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Midshipman for the class of eight. Thank you for that precious time and for coming here today. My question is, what are the rules in our military today that AI may dominate over them in future? Could you say the last sentence one more time? 
the rules in our military today that AI may dominate over them in future. Oh, our rules. I think what he's getting to, Paul, you talked about this, is China has less ethical rules than we do. Um, do they have it? Like take, yeah. So, yeah, taking prisoners, showing empathy, Western values. Um, Paul, do you want to jump on that, um, that AI would just blow through? Well, I think it's, um, it's a problem that exists not just in the AI space, but across the board yeah. when we face adversaries. Certainly, we've seen it in the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. We see it today between Israel and Hamas. We see it uh, in Ukraine, Russia, where Russia's committing war crimes. So I think that that is a continual challenge that to fight um, in a way that's consistent with our values as a nation is going to mean that our adversaries are going to do things that we wouldn't do, that we would find morally abhorrent. Um, I don't think that that means that we should then rush to commit atrocities alongside them. Um, and that's going to be the same with AI, that we're, as we adopt the technology, there are going to be things that maybe we don't want to do because it's not consistent with the law of war. It's not consistent with our values. It may not be consistent with military professional ethics, with the idea that, that frankly, all the panelists have been talking about are having humans in control yes. and in judgment and decision making. Um, and I think that that's actually okay. And I, I do think that we can fight and win while maintaining our values. I think detection is going to be a big piece of this. The ability to detect some sort of threat in all the various ways that it might come at us. I think AI would be exceptional at that. There was a book written in 1999 called Unrestricted Warfare by two Chinese colonels. It's their view of what's warfare. And everything is essentially warfare to them. Okay, things that we would never think or never think would be acceptable, or things that we would never do until it's done to us. Then what? Okay, that's we have to be able to think through those things, be able to detect the stuff coming at us. That's enormous, and I think that's going to be one of the major roles for AI. I think another important element is what is AI. I mean, we're really so early in this that we don't know what it will be, or what we will it will do, or what we will let it do five, 10, 15 years from now. So a lot of us, when we think of AI right now, we think of the generative AI, we think of chat GPT, we think of things like that. If you wind the clock back a little farther though, I mean, you can almost think of airplane autopilots as a form of artificial intelligence, right? It's taken yeah. in a bunch of different information. We gave it some very clear boundaries of what we want it to do, this heading, this airspeed, this altitude. And as recently as, 30-ish years ago, you still had pilots fighting the machine, right? There were a lot of reports uh, as autopilots were being integrated into some systems that the pilots, the human pilots, didn't understand what it was doing. So they gave them an off button, right? <laughs> disconnect the autopilot. Are we going to have a disconnect the AI button in the future? I don't know. Kind of like what wasn't there for the 737 Boeing planes a couple times, that off button. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, this is the first online question that we got, and it goes back to uh, your introduction, sir, at the start of the panel. Um, what is the responsibility of military leadership when the civilian leadership they serve has clearly made significant errors in judgment? Well, uh, if I could, one of the questions I frequently ask in the courses I teach is, do civilians have the right to be wrong? And the answer is they absolutely do. You give your best advice. You do everything you can, it puts you in a very difficult position, but when they make the decision, because they've been given the responsibility by the American people, you execute to the best of your ability. There's, you don't have any other choice except to maybe resign, and then you lose all control over your ability to affect anything. So, <laughs> just my thoughts. I agree. <laughs> and I agree also. If your orders are not illegal or immoral, you have an obligation to follow them. And I agree with that too. But the obligation comes with the, with the obligation to also give it a point of view that is is, is intelligent and informed. Yes. You, you must Absolutely. do that. Yes. You must do that. Have the moral courage to do that. Have the moral courage to do it because like that is an issue. Mm -hmm. Many times the moral courage to stand up there, and I'm telling you, woman, lieutenant commander, commander, I've done that. <laughs> and for the most part, my advice was listened to because I knew what I was talking about. And that's, that's where careerism comes in because when Shinseki stood up to a ill-conceived idea, if the rest of the joint staff would have said, we're all gonna resign, there is no way 
a single sector of defense would have plowed that through. Yeah. It, this is really hard, though, at, at times, because you're, you're not quite sure if they know more and what is in their minds. So you got to understand their equities also. Yes. And what's in inside their decision space? They may have some things that you don't know about, so it's got to be done with respect. And one of the things that we have to do when we become more senior is don't lose that moral courage. Because sometimes it's harder when you're more senior than when you're more junior. Because when you're, when you're junior, while well, you're just a lieutenant or whatever, okay? You, you start becoming a flag officer. And that is a, that's a, it's, it's a turn that you got to make. And I think it's just at times harder, but you, you owe it. You, as much as they should expect from you obeying orders, you have an obligation to give them the best advice. Yes. And I just want to make one point, uh, since I've obviously been critical of Secretary Rumsfeld. It was Paul Wolfowitz who started the Joint IED Defense Organization. I was in the meeting when they were briefing all these soldiers getting their legs blown up. And General Schoonmacher said, I have no more money to up armor the Humvees. And it was the most embarrassing moment as a military officer. The, the vice chiefs or chiefs were sitting around and Wolfowitz said, who's got money to give the Army? And nobody offered it up. And then he exploded and said, at 4 o'clock, I'm taking a half billion dollars to give to the Army. And either you guys find it or I'm taking it. And at about 3.59, Zakheim came running down the hallway. We found the money. But that's where civilians drove a solution to take care of our soldiers. And it was kind of a shocking moment. And that's where Mullen kind of rose to the, the call later, saying the Army's my number one priority. So the civilians often get it right, let's face it. Uh, but we need to be able to speak our minds. And, and just one final piece. Our system is built on civilian control of the military. Yes. They are the elected officials. Um, and when people advocate for overturning that, you can see the consequences in many countries yes. around the world just in the last six months yeah. uh, with a variety of coups in Africa because some military person thought their judgment was better than their elected leader. Professional militaries don't do that, period. All right. Uh, Luke Terrell. Good morning. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for being here today. Thank you. Uh, my question, kind of going along similar lines about AI, do you think there is a risk of over-reliance on AI systems in the event of potential tech failure or like hacking mm -hmm. uh, or jamming even for forward deployed forces? And if there are, what can be done to, to, to mitigate this risk? Um, yeah, I'm happy to do <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> every system has countermeasures, has vulnerabilities. AI systems um, can fail. Uh, they often can fail quite catastrophically. Uh, you know, if the situation that they're in is not consistent with their training data or kind of the parameters they were designed for, they don't really have the ability to flexibly adapt the way that humans can. Yes. Their intelligence profile is often quite, quite brittle, quite narrow. Um, but also they can be poisoned, they can be manipulated, they can be hacked. Um, and often in ways that, that humans can't be. And uh, I think that speaks to the value of having both humans and machines and having backups. But I think that's also true for, you know, technology writ large, for any kind of new technology. The first time that we flew F-22s across the International Dateline, they had a system crash because there was a bug in the software. They couldn't update the, um, the timing when they crossed the International Dateline, right? So we almost lost those aircraft. Um, so th that you know, there's lots of places where we use new technology. It's going to be unreliable at first, and we need to have the ability to kind of fall back on older methods, and that's going to be true for AI as well. But the uh, the exercise about if the world goes dark, how do you operate? And cities worry about that, states worry about it, and everybody does. One of the first leaders who really taxed his people was was when I think he was GIFCOM, General Mattis. And he said, I want to do this, this whole thing just dark. It's a really good question because you need to be able to make those decisions. So when I was here as a bad officer, about a year after that time, the Naval Academy <laughs> wiped out the celestial navigation courses. Mm -hmm. In two years, they, they brought it back because the notion was, what happens if you lose satellites? So they brought it back. It's a, great, it's a great question, and you need to be thinking about that as to how you operate when you can't connect. It's really but, you important. Know, to push Paul a little bit on this question, this is a great question. Um, 
I, I wrote an essay a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know if Peter Singer's here yet, but he got it to the second top essay for a Defense One conference. It was called The Five Futures of the Navy. One is uh, breakthroughs in AI, cyber war. They, that becomes defining. We just have a kill switch. Uh, advanced robotics without AI uh, becomes so lethal we can't even go in there. One is economic collapse. We can't afford to upgrade the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, but then a situation where basically AI gridlocks. Their AI is good as our AI. Yeah. And I made the argument that we've never had a single pilot that I know of ever turn against our country. We had some soldiers do this, but, but humans are completely trustworthy. Um, could you see a situation, Paul, where questions start to rise about can we trust AI? And, and basically the AIs lock out and we've got to go back to which side the Chinese, us or others have enough humans who could still run these things. I robot. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, it, it, you know, basically, if there's an arms race, like ballistic missiles became irrelevant because no one would shoot them at each other. Could that be what happens to AI that it just, they're so equal, we just got to stop and then the warfare comes down to the human level again? It, I mean, it could be, certainly. Um, I think that you always need to have the ability to fall back, to, to fight in the dark, to fight without some method of technology. And my observation has been that the old ways of fighting don't really go away. Right? We retain them often, um, they just become secondary. Right? So as we introduce tanks into ground combat, we still have infantry forces. They're not, um, in many cases at least, when the US Army is conducting maneuver warfare, the dominant way of fighting, but they are a method of fighting. We'll certainly see that unfolding in Ukraine in a big way. We still have bayonets on rifles. We're a long way from the days of the Swiss pikemen, but that's, that's still a sort of back, it's not the dominant way of fighting, but it is a, a method. Um, and there are, there are transition periods where this is really tough. We're seeing this unfold right now in the air domain in debates about beyond visual range engagements, air-to-air -air missile engagements, and kind of what is the trade-off you're willing to make in design space for aircraft for optimizing for that versus optimizing for air-to-air -air combat, for dogfighting. Um, and those are like valid questions to make, and the cost of getting it wrong are high. Um, and it's, that's part of the reason why militaries end up being quite conservative when it comes to new technologies. Just want to add one quick thing. Those old skills have to be sustained, though. They yeah. have to be taught in the first place, and they have to be sustained. Right. Just a, a plain example of land navigation in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Still, when you start out, it's still done with a map and compass, no GPS allowed. And a lot of people question, oh, we've got GPS. What? Well, what happens with GPS doesn't work? Or worse, what happens with the GPS is spoofed. Okay. Does somebody know? Do you? Does, can somebody train, associate, and realize? Hey, we're going the wrong way. Wait a second. This is not where we want to be. Okay. You have to sustain those skills. They have to be there as a backup for when the systems fail. Which, in my experience, they do. But, but this is a really important uh, question for our economy also. So when the Colonial Pipeline was hacked and through a cyber attack, it it jacked up the oil prices and put it a a shutter through the oil industry in America because they didn't think that they were that vulnerable. And they shut down the pipeline for a while. So this is a huge question for the functioning of societies in the 21st century. It's a huge, huge yeah. issue. Uh, over here, sir. Yeah, good morning. Ernie Spence, uh, my background's in uh, naval aviation. My question, I really appreciate the comments about the role of the senior civilians in uh, control and direction of the military. My, my question is really around some of the mid-grade civilians, what I've heard most of the discussion focus on today is the training, education, development of thinking skills amongst yeah. our uniformed military. But I would suggest that, at especially the operational strategic yeah. level, the role of those mid-grade civilians has an outsized impact on our ability to fight and win the future wars. Yeah. So especially when we're talking about areas of logistics, financial management, procurement, acquisition, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what the department is doing, what we should be thinking about doing in terms of how we develop those critical skills amongst our civilians. My observation uh, is that that's an area that we are rapidly falling apart, and I'm surprised at the lack of some basic capabilities that we probably see amongst the midshipmen in a room today that we don't see at those mid-grade civilian levels abilities to do analysis and provide input and direction to their bosses. Uh, I'd like to take a swing at that, if I may. <clears throat> so to, at some level, you're responsible for your own education, right? Um, I think there are five keys to success that you and you alone control. Education is one of those five. 
Uh, at the National Defense University, we have five different colleges of our 700 in residence, master's degree, joint professional military education students every year. Only half of them are US uniformed military. The other half are DOD civilians, Defense Intelligence Agency, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, et cetera. Another um, one sixth of the population is other US government agency civilians. State Department being the biggest among them, but Homeland Security, Commerce, Treasury, FBI. If it's a three-letter government organization, they probably have a student at the National uh, Defense University. And then International Fellows is the last component of that, along with a very tiny sliver of private sector fellows. But the overall question, I think, gets to what is the national security education available to the civilian workforce. There's a lot available yeah. to you as the uniformed military workforce. I would tell you that a lot of them take uh, Naval War College by distance learning or Army War College by distance learning, but they've got to know what's out there and then they have to take the initiative to go do it as well. But it is very important. But I'd say we at Uniform have a big role in that also from the standpoint of we have stereotypes about them, they have stereotypes about us. <laughs> How do you break through that and mm -hmm. develop a relationship with especially the mid-grade folks who at some point are going to be the senior folks to have a discussion with them, to help them understand things better, to help understand them better, um, listen to what they have to say. You know, you develop that relationship, you may change their, the advice to their boss. Uh, they may see, you know, the value of education. You can help them. Uh, do you know what's available to you? You can talk through some of the, I mean, some of them, a lot of them don't know that. All they know is they have to answer their boss. They have to get things done fast, and they move as, as fast as they possibly can. With one yeah. sentence, let me also riff off that. You made the, the word. This is the first time we have used that, that word, and it's you, of course, international. There's an international education piece here, too, to, to, to share the partnerships and the knowledge. And we won't go into it now, but that's part of this, too. We've got a question from our online audience. Uh, George Moore writes, my old boss was unpopular because he refused to do exercises from a script determined outcome. He would also ask in pre-exercise planning meetings whether he should write the after exercise critique before the exercise started, <laughs> since it might be the same as the prior exercise. Uh, his question is, oops, sorry. Uh, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, where is this question? Um, are exercises realistic and often enough that we have personnel who are currently well-trained and able, and I'll add, uh, able to adapt to changing circumstances? Well, one of the things we did in the Marine Corps is when I got, I was in charge of the Marine Air Ground Task Force Training Command out in the desert in 29 Palms where we do all our huge exercise. Um, and before I got there, we did live fire combined arms, shooting at targets, shooting at bushes, um, shooting at things that don't shoot back, don't have the ability to uh, interact with you, the, the chess player piece from the standpoint of going against a thinking enemy. So we changed the entire exercise. Part of it is still being able to do live fire combined arms because we have to be able to do that properly and maneuver with it. But the other part of it was no script, force on force, um, and we're learning a lot out there. Um, so it is being done in places. The Army does that to a degree also. Um, but God bless the boss, even though he's unpopular, because, I mean, that, where's the script in combat? There is none. Okay? You're, you're operating as a thinking enemy. So if, if you're do, conducting an exercise and the opponent isn't thinking and trying to get at you, trying to fool your plans, um, you're just kind of going through the motions. Check the block. Okay, we had an exercise. So building on that thought, <clears throat> I have served at four, four different times at combatant command headquarters, once at European Command, once at Central Command, twice at Southern Command. And one of the primary functions of the, combat, the regional combatant commands in particular is to bring the joint forces together to accomplish whatever mission they've been given. The services are good at training their individual service forces. Special operations is good at joint training with joint special operations. We've gotten better at things like the Joint Readiness Training Center, uh, the National Training Center out at Fort Irwin as well. But that operational level of warfare where you do combined arms, joint service training uh, is probably still an area where we can make some more progress. Absolutely. Uh, to the midshipmen. Uh, midshipman class, second class, midshipman second class, Luke Case. Um, my question goes back to what we were talking about earlier as far as uh, lessons observed versus lessons learned. Um, since October 7th, do you think that the current administration has responded in a way 
uh, that proves what we've learned from the United States' involvement in the Middle East, particularly after 9-11? Too soon. <laughs> yeah. Right now, they're, they're so caught up in how do they deal with this, all the stuff coming at them, um, what are we going to do? I mean, you, you need some emotional distance um, and some time distance to actually take a look and say, okay, what went right, what went wrong? You also have to have the willingness to do that, which we gen generally don't. So that's problematic. Uh, the Israelis themselves, um, there's a, a monograph that I've taught several uh, professional military education chefs is on. It's called We Were Caught Unprepared. Um, and it's about the Israeli military in 2006 fighting Hezbollah. You see a lot of parallels there. What, who, who was the learning organization? What did they learn from that? How did they get better? Um, were, they, were those factors that happened with October 7th? I mean, they had a multi-billion dollar security wall. Do they rely on technology too much going? There's no way they're going to be able to breach that wall. We'll know it if, as soon as, they, if, even if they start moving towards it, we'll know. Oops. So I don't know. If I can offer, um, the Wall Street Journal had an article by former CIA director, if you saw it, and um, his theme is a basically an epic failure of human intelligence. Um, he picked on the Navy a little bit. He said, there are more people assigned to one supercarrier than all the all the human agents in all of NATO. Um, and um, he said, more money spent on 11 football players on one Sunday than we spend on our whole human intelligence. Yeah. And, um, and so this is getting to what we're talking about, over-reliance on technology, machines, hacking, deception. Um, I personally, I've been retired for a couple of years, but I'm on the second half. I was furious to think about whatever the Southeast Division commander in Israel, who maybe got... <laughs> You know, bamboozled, bored, ham the border guy. And now literally the world order is in convulsions of that one command structure that hadn't thought critically and imaginatively. And um, yeah, and now we're all dealing with it. So I think yeah, the lessons are too. This isn't new. 73 war had a lot of parallels yeah. with the Egyptians coming across the canal, uh, the Suez Canal. A lot of parallels. That'll never happen until it did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Over here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel. I want to say thank you so much for this panel. Um, so my question for you goes back to kind of with AI and that education aspect with um, the fact that AI is like programmed and machine learning is trained to a certain extent. What are the limitations when it comes to de developing some of these models in which to train? Um, students with, and what are some ways that we can kind of overcome some of those limitations? AI to train <laughs> students. Um, yeah, um, I think it sort of remains to be seen. Like the most of the AI systems we've seen over the last decade are very narrow AI systems. So they are good for very specific tasks, for playing chess, for example, or playing the Chinese strategy game Go. In those instances, those models have been very effective in raising the performance of human players. So human chess grandmasters are now looking at AI systems playing chess, and they're learning new opening moves that humans have never seen before. And they're learning new tactics and approaches. We've seen this in poker, too, where AI systems are not just better than humans, but they, they bet differently. And then human poker players are adapting their strategies to try to adopt some of the things that AI are doing um, to kind of mix up some of their betting strategies in ways that, that could be more effective. Um, what's, what we're likely to see, I suspect, is that domain expands over time, where there are other things. I mean, those are like very narrow games, very confined domains. But as AI gets better, there will be other areas where AI might be able to do something that's new and different and creative. Maybe they'll be war gamings or simulations that we'll be doing, and you have an AI run it, and you might see some tactics that people hadn't thought of. And you know, we'd have to, we'll have to think then about, okay, how do we want to learn from that? What is the lesson? How do we want to adopt um, some of those ideas? But I think there was real opportunity there. The most compelling example I heard this was from Brockman, uh, who came, and it made a lot of faculty uncomfortable. And we have a task force right now. We hired the former provost of the Air Force Academy, who's now the president of the University of North Dakota. And he's leading our AI task force and learning. Our legislature's passed a kind of emergency bill to study AI, deep fakes. So we're all kind of scrambling. Our, our governor's running for president, by the way, Doug Burgum. He's a software executive. He's a good man. So 
think about it. Anyway, um, so, so we're doing a lot of stuff in North Dakota. Um, but this is what Brockman said, and I have to admit, it caught my attention. And I remember something happened to me in physics. Do you guys still take physics here? I was sitting next to um, a classmate, and um, his brother was absolutely brilliant in my company. He became a nuke doing it. His brother kind of struggled. He was more of a linguistic guy. And he asked kind of a dumb question, and the physics professor just crushed him in class. He never asked another question. And the physics professor was angry because he'd answered it three times already to other people, and I guess he wasn't paying. So what Brockman said is, you know, a lot of people are intimidated by human shame. Yes. AI will never shame you. And he says, I think the day's coming where you're going to get an AI partner, and they're going to learn your sleep habits, they're going to learn what you like, where you struggle, and this thing will be with you for life. It will never be that favorite high school math teacher that leaves you, and it will help you learn, and it will teach you. It will never judge you, unless you want to build a bomb, maybe. Um, so back to your question, I think that could come, and I'm on a national commission with Michael Crow, Arizona State. He's just a giant uh, in higher ed. He was an ROTC student, but after Vietnam, they didn't let him commission. He said their math outcomes are already going up dramatically by having low-level AI algorithms teach the math to yeah. people without you know, the class, right? The last person to turn the quiz in, right? You know, and so anyway, I don't know if you're getting there on education pedagogy. But Interesting enough, science fiction, you know, you, you read some science fiction that, and some of the stuff that come up, it's like, why can't we do that? Speaking of that, John Scalzi's Old Man's War, that's exactly what he writes about, obviously in the future. Um, and it's a very interesting book if, you're, if you like science fiction. So military education, professional military education is moving towards outcomes-based right military education, and you just heard the doctor mention the word outcomes. An important part of that is defining the outcomes you want your graduates uh, to be able to achieve. So I think one area where AI may be helpful in the future, and this bridges a couple of these thoughts, um, maybe it's not your AI companion for life, but maybe it's the AI companion in the classroom right. who can analyze each of the students, figure out where they are, in <laughs> reference to the desired set of outcomes, and then make recommendations for how to get you there. A very practical illustration of this, although it's not really AI, was the Air Force's foray into pilot training next. So they would sit each of the pilot candidates down in front of a very simple um, uh, simulator, but it had eye tracking software as well. So now the system knows what the student is looking at, when the student is looking at it. And this became particularly relevant for uh, takeoffs and landings, especially landings. The two things you're really looking at, how many aviators out there? What, what are you looking at on your landing? Airspeed and altitude, right? And sometimes the students get distracted and the eye tracking software can say, you spent X amount of time looking at your airspeed indicator, you spent X amount of time looking at the altitude indicator, you spent X amount of time over here, <laughs> you know, which may not have been relevant to what you were trying to do at the time. <laughs> so I think that's a potential application of AI in the classroom, in education for the future. There's another one here too. So I was the president of a, of a large um, two-year school outside sh Chicago, a, a great community college. We did some testing with high schoolers, and to your point, uh, Mark, it was it was great. It was it was early AI teaching math, and we all of a sudden had students one who did not believe they could do math, believing they could because they had an AI component with them, and then they began to to believe in themselves as learners. Think about that for admissions and recruitment for the military where people are told what they cannot do or what they can do based upon ASVAB score. Mm. Now we add AI to it, and now I'm, I am starting to be a math learner or whatever. The change in, in the entire community college ecosystem is phenomenal with these AI teachers and companions with pilots. And frankly, it is a key to getting folks in the workforce both within the military and out and outside of it. It will help people to learn faster and better and not be judged right up front mm -hmm. as to what you walked into, but what you are able to become. Uh, next question. Uh, about five years ago, SecNav Spencer came up with the Education for Sea Power initiative. 
Uh, it didn't last very long, um, <laughs> but it was fully embraced, although it didn't last very long. And now Secnav del, del Toro has come up with it again. Why will this be different? Can I answer this? Because I was on the EE the e for us board, and Steve Deal, who's not here, and B.J. Armstrong, are you still here? Yeah. Terrific thinking. I mean, the work was, it was, was phenomenal. The diligence was phenomenal. And that diligence and, and the conclusions, the analysis, the work still stands. So, so the, 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 the homework is still good. It's about the decisions that leaders make based upon resources or perspectives or dispositions. But this work can follow through with a leader who's willing to pick it up. So Secnav Del Toro saw that. He's been in all three of the schools. He's, he is committed to education. But the work that was done continues on. So he picked up that work and then stylized it to, to the current time. So I think it's good work. It will continue to be good work. It's, it's about leaders and their, and their choices as to how much it, it then is sustained. I can just add uh, three key things in this strategy, which have been signed out. Everyone should read it. it. Is one, we need to get more resources. They recognize that. Right. I can't imagine being a faculty member at Annapolis now, the housing prices. This is insane. But you right. know, we've got to do things like that. Secondly, we've got to think as a Navy university system. The War College, the PG School, the Navy Community College, the Naval Academy, the Marine Corps Schools, thinking, integrated, getting to scale, sharing. It says in there, share professors. If a Chinese language, the Naval Academy, has a health issue, then someone from the War College should teach that class. Correct. Right? Okay. But the third thing, which is absolutely groundbreaking, is it links career management and education, which we said earlier, a observed fit rep going to the general school. OK, so it's got real stuff in there. But the last thing I'd say, he's telling all the leaders, no, you need to do this. I can't micromanage you here. It's like, Correct. It's exactly so they've got to get on it. They, they can't slow roll this. But it does take some money and time. Yep. It also changes. It also takes changing culture. Absolutely. Because the service has to value Absolutely. that education. And if they don't, all the education for sea power stuff in the world is not going to go anywhere. So I want to uh, forgive me. So I want to I want to applaud the uh, Marine Corps on this. Commandant Berger put his own stamp on learning and education. At NPS, our numbers of Marines, both enlisted and officer, has doubled. Um, your Marines are doing great work and they're the, uh, the top of the class. So when the education strategy said, we're going to start doing fitness reports, the Marine Corps began that while back. And to let you know, the fitness report standing and ranking is not based upon your GPA or your or your grades. You got to be passing and doing it that decently. Helps. But I mean, <laughs> but whether or not, you know, you're, you're, you're the anchor person or either the top, that's not what is grading people. What the Marine Corps grading is, is the value of the research you're doing linked to the Commandant's guidance and the Marine Corps priorities, and how does it now transition to capability. It's about how you're applying the knowledge, not that you acquired it, it's how you're applying it. And that's how the fitness, re, uh, the fitness reports are being done by the Marine Corps. Navy is thinking about it, but the tribes and the Navy have reasonable concerns. So, um, but the core has, has been leading the way on this. So just two points real quickly, and I'd like to associate myself with all the comments about you have to value the education, right? Both in your service and Department of Defense wide. And there's two different ways that Congress helped us do this in 1986 because we were incapable of doing it ourselves. Yes. Uh, and the first of which was, in order to be promoted to general or flag rank, you had to be a joint qualified officer. And to be a joint qualified officer, that requires a joint duty assignment, and it requires joint professional military education phase two, which all of the service war colleges grant, all of NDU's war colleges grant, and we have a 10-week course to certify other officers in that. The other thing they said was, as soon as you make that flag rank, you have to come for JPME level three, which is taught at NDU, it's capstone, right? So I see almost every new uh, Navy Admiral, Marine General, Air Force General, Space Force, Army, because they have to go through that course uh, to develop a, a sense of jointness in the flag officer ranks. So how you value it is very important. 
We probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. This, is a, this will be quick. Um, I have been very concerned about the erosion of critical thinking. Uh, as part of my self-improvement, I've been doing a lot of research into it, uh, wrote a, a never-to-be-published book on the subject. <laughs> but in the, in the course of my research, I uncovered a startling fact that I think will startle everyone in this room. I'd enjoy your reaction. Uh, since 2013, the majority of states have scrapped teaching the scientific method. The next generation science standards have replaced it with teaching science and engineering practices. Mm -hmm. And Maryland is amongst 50, uh, a majority of states that have scrapped teaching the scientific method well, while in, they think in K it, through 12 education. I can say that I've got a review essay, which um, was sent to me by, uh, through the Naval War College, by the way. Um, a brilliant State Department officer at the War College has written an essay about um, Russia and misinformation, okay? And, and, and one of the things they bring up is our attitude toward truth and facts and whatnot. Yes. And said, when we have challenged, just like Paul was saying, we have a, you know, the law of war, the Geneva Convention. Putin is saying, but you have postmodernism. You say everything's the same. There is no truth. And so I think you're onto something that we have to be careful what we tell young people that it's not scientific. Because I'm telling you, there's a way to take a plane off, and it's Bernoulli's principle. I don't care how you feel about it, okay? You know? <laughs> um, and so you're onto something because they, they're, in her article, she says, it's amazing. Every time we criticize something like, hey, this is the law of war, this is this, then he rolls us. But yeah, but you don't believe in anything, everything's equal. You, you can't agree on anything over there. So well, you're, you're on to so this ties to Enron After 20, 2013 was when the NGSS was invoked in most states and they scratched teaching of the scientific method. Uh, well, you should run method. for office. We can't do that, but you can run for office, okay? That's <laughs> well, not my point, but my, my just point is... On, just to build on the comment, though, and I know we're running out of time here. So in defense of why so many of the Naval Academy uh, graduates have to have a STEM degree... Uh, if you graduate from the Air Force Academy, you will graduate with a Bachelor of Science in whatever your major is, even if it's English. My major was astronautical engineering, a.k.a. rocket science. Turns out it's hard. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> and then when I graduated, the Air Force and I agreed I would never do that, right? So that's why my master's degrees are all uh, in the humanities and international relations. But it teaches you a way of thinking about problems that is valuable as you continue through your careers uh, and through life, so yeah. hang with it in your uh, mm. in your science classes. You'll. But get I think. But I think what we're losing is scientific method is the objective search for truth. I mean, that's a, a way to boil it down. That's being lost all over the place. There is no more objective search for truth unless you're actively doing it yourself. There's too many people out there canceling each other, shouting over each other, not listening, just trying to inflict their view on somebody else. I mean, that that's problematic. In fact, it's worse than that because K through 12 teachers are teaching not to do that. Yes, exactly. I'd, I'd like to just close this out, if I could, with a question from a midshipman. Quick okay. question Later, and then quick, quick response. <laughs> Thank you all for your time today. How will the United States combat misinformation campaigns driven by AI? And with the influence of misinformation, how will we maintain the trust of the American people in the government and military? You know, um, planes, I think it was you who... Be curious, ask questions, Absolutely. ask questions. The smartest leaders that I know had great questions. And so ask questions because that will get the conversation going and, and be curious because there's always going to be something in front of you that is confusing. So ask questions. And some of those questions have to be uncomfortable questions because, again, you're searching for the truth, and that truth may actually be something that is totally opposite to what you were originally thinking. So you have to be able to think outside the box. You have to be able to be open-minded, literally open-minded, uh, and ask uncomfortable questions. And very, very perfect. So the, we, get, we have talked a lot about science and, and, the, and technology. And, an intelligent force knows about culture and about the humanities and about the philosophers and, and then about science. So we talk about science and the art of warfare, but that is what John Paul Jones had talked about. That's what we saw with Nimitz. They're talking about the fully rounded individual, and that means a continuous learner for the your whole lifetime. Absolutely. I make one other point. You all know the catastrophe of Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden was a 
a high school or college dropout. He was a technician and he was turned because he didn't have the education you have. Philosophy, history, he didn't understand the world. So that's why it's crucial as an officer. You're going to have enlisted people that until they get to community college are going to be very vulnerable to misinformation. Um, but you're getting grounded education. So I think you're part of that front line of misinformation. You'll have officers that are that way too. Yeah. 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 All right. Sadly, we're out of time. We've got about 10 more online questions, and I think we could have probably gone for another hour. This was just an amazing conversation. I want to thank our panelists. I want the the Naval Institute wants to thank our panelists with a uh, copy of the book War Transformed by Mick Ryan, which I would point out um, starts with this very intriguing notion that in 2020, India and China went to war using hand clubs up in Oxai Chin, right? So it's not all about technology. It's also about the human element of, of warfare. Um, we're going to go now to a 45-minute lunch break. Lunch will be served on floors one and three, and we also have seating on floors one, two, and three. If you are not sure where to go, please see one of our staff members. We can help you find a seat. We will meet back in here promptly at 1230 for the keynote with General Mattis. Thank you, everyone.